Hey there, welcome to That Dang Dad, my name is Phil. You know, recently I've heard some people say that they'd like to see me do a little bit more theory on this channel. So, tonight, let's crack the books and analyze a short text about commodification written by one of the preeminent Marxist scholars of our day, Dr. Brittany Jean Spears. I'm of course referring to her seminal essay, Work Bitch. The essay begins with Dr. Spears asking the same question twice in a row. You want ah, you want ah. The ah she's asking if we want is of course referring to Jacques Lacan's concept of the objet petit a, or loosely translated, the unattainable object cause of desire. Slavoj Žižek defines the objet petit a as the lack, a hole at the center of the symbolic order, the mere appearance of some secret to be explained, interpreted, etc. Simply put, it is anything that sets desire into motion, and here Spears is asking us to begin the discussion by turning our minds to the things that do just that. Spears provides a rapid-fire list of things we might desire. A hot body, a Bugatti, a Maserati, a Lamborghini looking hot in a bikini, a fancy life, a big mansion, and partying in France. Interjected into this list is the command, you better work, bitch. You better work, bitch. Now, get to work, bitch. At first, Spears' essay seems like just another steaming coil of hustle culture hastily squirted onto the LinkedIn page of someone catastrophically uninteresting. But did you notice? Something curious is happening within her list of desires. A big mansion, a French soiree, and three luxury vehicles, a fancy life indeed, are afforded an equal value to a hot body that looks good in a bikini. Mansions, party goods like food and wine and sports cars are all in the Marxist sense, commodities. In Capital Volume 1, Marx says, A commodity is, in the first place, an object outside of us, a thing that by its properties satisfies human wants of some sort or another. The nature of such wants, whether, for instance, they spring from the stomach or from fancy, makes no difference. Don't you find it interesting, then, that Spears categorizes an attractive body as just such a commodity? How can our body be an object outside of us? To understand this, recall that for Marx, not everything made with human labor is a commodity. If a person grows their own potato to eat for dinner, that's not a commodity. It's simply a use value for them to enjoy. No, for something to be a commodity, it must have value to others. He says, To become a commodity, a product must be transferred to another whom it will serve as a use value by means of exchange. Thus, according to Spears, a hot body, a body that looks good in a bikini, can ultimately be a commodity to be exchanged to exist as a use value for someone else. As Spears is weaving these comparisons together, she continues to intone, You better work, bitch. You better work, bitch. Now get to work, bitch. Work. 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 For Marx, labor is the important factor in the production of any commodity. If a worker takes a piece of wood and fashions it into a chair, that object has an obvious use value, you know, you can sit in it to rest. But once the company owner takes that chair, prices it, and packages it for sale, it starts to lose connection both to the hands that made it and the purpose it was made for. The price abstracts away the time and expertise used by the worker to craft an item fit for purpose, and it creates the illusion that a commodity has some intrinsic value just by virtue of existing. And as we can see in things like real estate and oil futures, this allows commodities to be exchanged by wealthy entities who have no actual interest in the use value of the items, only in those items' ability to store these abstracted, fluctuating values. Think about how capitalists will shut down hospitals that don't generate profit. The entire purpose and benefit of that commodity has been completely abstracted away, and with it, its relationship to the community. Back to Spears' essay, we now see that not only can someone's body become a commodity for someone else to profit from, that relationship also abstracts away the very human living that body in the world. It's the same for anything produced for profit. Capitalism necessarily alienates the worker from the product of their labor, even when that product is their own beautiful beach bod. Says Marx, On the one hand, the process of production incessantly converts material wealth into capital, into means of creating more wealth and means of enjoyment for the capitalist. On the other hand, the laborer is a source of wealth, but devoid of all means of making that wealth his own. Thus, within a capitalist framework, anyone who does not own the means of production is necessarily, 
and merely a work bitch. Here, it's important to recall that at the very beginning of the essay, Spears evokes Lacan's objet petit a to kick off her list of commodities. Lacanian scholar Sean Homer writes, The objet a is not therefore an object we have lost, because then we would be able to find it and satisfy our desire. It is rather the constant sense that we have as subjects that something is lacking or missing from our lives. Thus, it would seem Spears wants us to go beyond merely seeing the ways we've been alienated from this or that specific commodity, and instead, let the commodity form itself show us the void hiding beneath it. With all this in mind, I propose that Spears' repeated intonations of you better work bitch are not her advice on how to obtain these unattainable objects of desire, but rather her representation of the way the dominant order whispers to us from every corner of our lives to work to labor, to produce wealth for others. Think of how sitcoms often have episodes poking fun at characters who are out of work, and how, in 2021, the news media acts as a stenographer for businesses that can't retain workers with their low pay, and how the President of the United States gives speeches about making sure Americans can get back to work and grow the economy. In the same way that Spears is constantly demanding us bitches get back to work, so too is almost every American institution all the time. Antonio Gramsci called this cultural hegemony and wrote about how the ruling class mobilizes a mighty army of agents like the schools and the media and the churches to facilitate, as he puts it, the spontaneous consent given by the great masses of the population to the general direction imposed on social life by the dominant fundamental group. This consent is historically caused by the prestige and consequent confidence which the dominant group enjoys because of its position and function in the world of production. Thus, it's not enough for capital to merely alienate us from our labor and our own bodies. Capital must also alienate us from our own ability to consent to the world we're living in. Does that sound troubling to you? It certainly does to Spears. As soon as she establishes this dehumanizing reality, she literally sounds an alarm and says with great urgency, watch out now, because here it comes. Here comes the smasher. Here comes the master. Here comes the big beat. Big beat disaster. Thankfully, Dr. Spears isn't just a cultural critic, she's also a revolutionary. She doesn't simply alert us to the way that capital commodifies our bodies and our labor, she offers us a method of response if we can pick up the message she's putting down for us. First, we have to break it off and break it down, meaning internalize it and seriously conduct a material analysis of the world around us. She invites us to hear her sound, and through this, achieve class consciousness. Once we do that, we have our instructions. Tell somebody in your town, spread the word, make it bubble up. To put it simply, organize. Spears is unequivocal. We cannot do this alone because revolution by definition makes us enemies of law enforcement and the current state hierarchy. So how do you make any liquid bubble up? Simple, you agitate. The same way we let Spears and Marx break it down for us, we must break it down for our fellow worker, our neighbor, our friends, until they too hear our sound. Spears concludes the passage by referring to herself as a bad bitch, but a bitch we're loving on. And I think this is so key. The revolution must, must, must come primarily from a place of love for the working class, not a revanchist bloodlust. We must not become the smasher that we've replaced. Now, Spears understands this is easier said than done, and she warns us. They will try to try us, but, she says, they can't deny us. They don't believe us, but they're gonna need us, so we should hold our heads high. How can she be so sure this confidence is warranted? It's because everything around us is built by the working class. None of the conveniences of modern life would exist without workers. Spears is confident because she knows that if the workers achieve class consciousness and if they organize against capital, they cannot be denied because they are necessary to build and maintain the entirety of modern life with their labor. Here she echoes the words of Frederick Engels. But what gives these unions and the strikes arising from them their real importance is this, that they are the first attempt of the workers to abolish competition. They imply the recognition of the fact that the supremacy of the bourgeoisie is based wholly upon the competition of workers among themselves, meaning upon their want of cohesion. 
And precisely because the unions direct themselves against the vital nerve of the present social order, they are so dangerous to this social order. The moment the workers resolve to be bought and sold no longer, at that moment, the whole political economy of today is at an end. Spears' essay begins its final lap with more repetition. Work, work, work. Work it out, work it out, work it out. While the mention of work earlier in the essay fell more within the context of labor, here I claim she is speaking about a different kind of work, the work of solidarity. Spears concludes her essay with a demand on the reader, work it out. I read this in terms of the various conflicts that pit the working class against one another. Spears seems to be asking us to set aside our distrust and our prejudices and bigotries and work it out for the common good. Here I'm reminded of a letter written by Marx in 1870 in which he discusses how English and Irish proletarians distrusted each other, and makes passing reference to how poor whites in the United States were encouraged to be similarly antagonistic towards former slaves. He says, This antagonism is artificially kept alive and intensified by the press, the pulpit, the comic papers, in short, by all the means at the disposal of the ruling classes. This antagonism is the secret of the impotence of the working class, despite its organization. It is the secret by which the capitalist class maintains its power. Of course, solidarity should not be a false peace built on ignoring structural injustices. True solidarity comes from making your emancipation a condition of my own. We're all in this together, we're all being dehumanized by the dominant order, Stop letting bosses and the media tell you that trans people or Muslim immigrants or disabled neighbors are the ones stealing from you, the ones ruining it for everyone else. Capital is the thief. Capital is the big beat disaster. So work it out and get to work. And it is this last point that I believe makes Spears' essay a crucial text for revolutionaries. It avoids the aesthetic comfort of murals depicting chiseled warriors with rifles and glorious victors posing triumphantly in fields of flowers against a golden sunrise. Dr. Spears is very clear. Revolution will be work. Work, work, work. So work it out, work it out, work it out. Brittany Jean Spears concludes with a call to action that is perhaps really the only way to end an essay of this nature. If you've truly internalized her message and you truly accept your place in the struggle, there's really only one thing left to say to you. You'd better work, bitch. <laughs> <laughs>